Kobe Dean is still has fans in the front office. You know, I think oh, Howie, yeah. Rose, Howie Roseman talked glowingly about him earlier this offseason. But, you know, again, Vic Fangio wasn't here when the Kobe Dean was drafted. And I think there's something to that. I think Vic might not necessarily love the Kobe as much. And So we'll talk about all that. Let's go to BLG, who just joined us in the green room. So we'll bring up Brandon Lee Gout. Now, BLG, welcome to the show, man. How you doing today? Doing good, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, good to see you, uh, BLG. I got myself in trouble. Uh, so I want to scale back. We're we're obviously in the off season, um, so we're throwing a bunch of stuff. Somehow we got on to August trades, mm. where Howie's had somewhat of a history. Never works out, but somewhat of of a history of player for player trades in August. The Eli Harrells of the world for Ryan Bates, Dennis Kelly for Doriel Green Beckham. If you want to go way back, that's wow. one ship, I guess. Yeah, but. There's been this history. Ugo Amadi, mm. I think, was traded yeah, I remember that KJ one. Ortega Whiteside. Um, again, rarely works out. But if you're trying to get value, and I look at this cornerback room, which is now 14 deep BLG with Perry Nickerson on board. <laughs> um, and you're looking to get value and trying to get maybe a third receiver or maybe a linebacker that can get in the mix, or maybe even a backup safety. Who's the who's the guy that you can trade to get that? Well, maybe you could kind of do the reverse Jordan Matthews trade, and uh, you know where they traded an extra receiver for another cornerback. Maybe you can trade an extra cornerback for another receiver there. But yeah. uh, I don't, you know, I don't know who that would be in terms of. But know, that's I, how, I think. And hear me out. The guy who would have, because you're not trading certain players. You're not trading, obviously, Slay's 33. You're not trading uh, Slay. Uh, yep. You think you're a Super Bowl contender. Obviously, you're not trading Mitchell or DeGene. You're not trading Ringo. So it goes down to that level. And I'm saying, you know, Josh Job, great special teams player. You're not going to get anything for him other than a conditional seventh round pick. Same thing with Eli Ricks. The guy who might be able to get you something, BLG, Isaiah Rogers. Yeah, you would you would maybe try to like sell high on him relatively. Yeah. Um That's what I said. especially, you. you know, he's 27. Um, he's on the last year of his deal, you know, as opposed to these younger rookie cornerbacks that they have. So, you know, conceivably he could be gone after this season anyway. Uh, you don't have him locked up long term. So I think but, you know, I don't know how much other teams are buying into, you know, like OTA reports and stuff. Yeah, of, well, that's you know, true. it's been a long time since they've seen him look good. So I wonder about that. I would say Rick's makes sense from a standpoint of, um, you know, you would like you said, I think you would keep Job over him from a depth standpoint just because you feel better about Job's special teams ability. Um, but again, who how much value does Eli Ricks really have? I don't think a ton. I think you could get, you know, a comparable kind of receiver who's kind of on the bubble somewhere, probably, but you know, nothing too exciting. Yeah. That's the Eli Harold for uh, Ryan right. Bates trade, which right. uh, worked out for the Bills. Ryan Bates is yeah. an okay player. So um wasn't I believe an undrafted free agent at the time. Uh yes. that was a rookie season. So uh, you never know with the August trades. I, I just wanted to throw that at you. I probably I should never have mentioned it because you know somebody's gonna write McMullen said you should trade Isaiah Rogers. I did not <laughs> say that. I said maybe he might have some value mm -hmm. and potentially sell high. But well, well let uh, me give BLG another maybe just on the other side of it. I, I know mm -hmm. you, you say it's not happening, Johnny Mac, but I do want to ask BLG is there any chance that they would think about moving on from Slay? I mean, he's no. the top end guy. You only have a year left with him. You know what I mean? Where you want to get the young guys, rip off the band aid, maybe, and just go to the young guys. They weren't a good pass defense last year. Slay, I think, was ranked 28th or 30th or 29th on the PFF. Mm -hmm. So just wonder if you maybe could move on from him when you're going to move on from him after the year anyway and keep one of the extra young guys who are showing major potential. Yeah, I don't think they would with how they value him. Um, I think it's a valid question to ask because of, you know, we saw that steep drop off from James Bradbury last year. And I'm not saying necessarily it's guaranteed that Slay will be the same thing this year, but he's going to be 34, I think, this season, turns 34 yeah. in January. So, you know, that's like you're playing with fire in terms of a cornerback who could easily fall off a cliff really fast. 
And if you could get any value for him, maybe it would be this might be your last chance. But you know, he's a team captain. Um, I you know, Harry Roseman talked about the value of having guys not just being able to like tell the younger guys what to do, but kind of lead by example. And I think Slay is that for the Eagles in that quarterback room. So I don't think they will. All right, PLG, we got to ask you. It's annoying, but where are you on Jalen Hurts and his awkward answer to a layup of a question that he could have easily answered, but for some reason could not answer about the head coach of this football team? Yeah, it didn't hit me in the moment. Um, but then, like, you know, thinking about it more after, um, I mean, it just kind of fits a larger pattern. I mean, we saw Jalen Hurts really not take an opportunity to speak uh, with such endorsement about Sirianni after the playoff game. So it's weird. And the way I phrased it is I think, you know, Jalen can be kind of needlessly cagey sometimes about things or needlessly combative about things. For example, John, um, you were at that press conference last week. He's asked about, you know, what he's going to do during the break here. And he kind of says like no football, non-football, non-football yeah. stuff. Yeah. And like, okay, that's fine. But, you know, you could show a little bit maybe more of your personality and humanity and say, you know, something like going to go to the pool or going to take a trip. You know, you'd be vague. It's not even like you're spilling your secrets here. You could kind of just kind of, you know, again, not be so combative. (laughs) Uh, I know everyone thinks the media is out to get these players. I don't think that's the case, especially with a question like that. Just, you know, um, so I think there are times where Jalen Hurts kind of, you know, uh, again, a little bit needlessly combative, a little bit needlessly cagey. So I think that's a part of it. But, I mean, the fact remains, had a chance to really endorse Nick Sirianni, and he didn't. Yeah, and and the part that bothers me, uh, BLG, isn't what he said. Um, it's, it's what – and I go back to the Seattle game where Nick made himself look kind of foolish by that weird yeah. explanation about what went on. And only AJ stepped up and said, you know what? Mm-hmm. That was our fault. Jalen still hasn't stepped up and said right. uh, that 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 bothers me. Yeah. But then I go back to early on in that uh, press conference. I asked Jalen, it, it, the last time we talked to him, he mentioned being in sponge mode. And I asked him the question, that have you progressed from that into being more vocal on what you want with the offense? And he took a left turn and threw that 95% Mm. out there because he wanted it out there. Mm -hmm. And so he's very intentional too. So I think it's, um, you can't just say, oh, that's Jalen being Jalen, I think, when it comes to anything, because he's very intentional. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that? I think about how, on that point, I think about how, you know, he showed up to his press conference after the Tampa Bay Buccaneers loss during the 2021 season, you know, uh, with the boot on his foot. Yeah. Um, kind of, I think that's like, hey, I was dealing with something. So just so you know. Uh, and I wonder if, you know, I don't know how much Jalen Hurts cares about these things, but I think he does at some level care about his public or uh, he's a human being i think everyone cares about how they're uh, perceived at some level and uh i wonder if jalen hurts throws out that 95 percent there with um the knowing that you know he's thrown a decent amount of interceptions and like hasn't you know he hasn't looked his sharpest in the spring no. i remember how he by contrast i think he looked awesome in 2022 that year and those couple of spring practices we saw and that is not exactly the same player we saw this spring. That doesn't mean it's press the panic button, the season's over. But I think there's an awareness that maybe, you know, he's not at fully where he wants to be yet. And therefore, he is kind of tempering expectations or kind of tempering the criticism with that kind of statement. We had Mike Gill on, who was in London. So he wasn't really too entrenched in what was happening in Eagle Land. And he kind of came on an original. He's like, I don't know. It sounds like it's May or June and we're blowing this up into not making something out of nothing. I don't know if I agree with them. I mean, I, I do to some level, but I think that was an easy opportunity for Jalen Hurts as the leader of this club. I don't care if you hate Nick Sirianni. I really don't. In that moment, publicly, to the media, with all your, you know your team's going to see it, you know your coach is going to see it, why not just give him a, a, a bone? And he didn't do it. And I thought that was, maybe that's more telling on Jalen Hurts' instinctual 
style of leadership where he didn't want to go there. And we do talk about how intentional he is with his words. I don't think Jalen said that accidentally. I, I really don't. I think he, I think there was some intention, whatever it might've been, maybe it wasn't malicious or maybe it wasn't a, a bad thing or a negative thing, but I can only make of it what I did. And, and it, it wasn't great for me to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, again, I think what often is most telling is what people don't say. <laughs> and again, what Jalen Hurts didn't say there um, sticks out and maybe, you know, we, you know, we're focusing on it a lot because there's literally nothing else going on now until yeah. basically training camp begins. So there's some truth to that. Maybe that we're, you know, focusing on it more than we usually would if it was said in, you know, a game week or something. And then all of a sudden they're playing the game and we're turning the page. Well, was that, that part of the intentionality BLJ? He knows we're about to be off for seven weeks and it's like, Oh, let me, let me stir this pot of stew real quick. <laughs> I don't think I don't think that I don't think he wanted that, but you know I think uh, he was just being honest, and you know that's kind of where it lies for now. Yep. Um, over at uh, BleedingGreenNation.com, everybody should check out. Brandon uh, has his winners uh, from the spring, his losers from the spring. Um, I want to take issue with one of your losers, okay, and not from the standpoint of. Everybody's got them on the loser list, so okay. I'm not singling you out. But I think people are are turning the page on Nicobe Dean mm-hmm. way too early, way too early. I think we're going to show up in, in late July, BLG, and he's going to be the starting middle linebacker, mm. and everybody's going to be somewhat surprised. Um, I think there's a lot of context to his spring. If you go back to the first voluntary OTA, he wasn't even in team drills. He was sort of at the end of his rehab and he was working individual. And I think he was back out there for the second, if I'm correct. Yeah. He was rotating Um, in and out in the second one. The second and and mainly second team work, a little bit of a first team, same thing in minicamp, mainly second team work. And I think every everybody's just said, well, Devin White and Zach Vaughn are the guys. I don't believe that. Am Hmm. I crazy? I don't think you're crazy. I think Nicobe Dean still has fans in the front office. You know, I think Howie Howie Roseman talked glowingly about him earlier this offseason. But, you know, again, Vic Fangio wasn't here when Nicobe Dean was drafted. And I think there's something to that. I think Vic might not necessarily love Nicobe as much. And and for me, you know, I always go back to, um, you know, Nicobe he has, you know, he was, he was, there's a lot of hype for Nicobe when he was drafted because, oh my gosh, what a steal. The Eagles got this guy in the third round. Can't believe it. He's going first round in mock drafts. Um, you know, my thinking on that is, well, sometimes players fall for a reason. And uh, I wanted to see something from him in both of his two training camps thus far. And I don't know that there was like a single play even, or it's like a single highlight rep from those two training camp entirety. Uh, this, the last two years of training camp, I just, I can't point to it like a play in a, in a practice that just really stood out. And therefore, you know, I'm not going into this training camp expecting it's going to be magically different and he's going to pop. And by, you know, by contrast, like Devin white was making plays in the spring. That's more than I've ever seen from the Kobe Dean in a practice setting. Um, Zach bond, not as flashy necessarily of an OTA uh, session this spring, but you know, looked fluid in coverage at times where, you know, I, I, we, there was that one rep where he's running stride, for stride with Saquon Barkley down the left sideline. I'm like, okay, that's something. And I just haven't seen the Kobe flash in that way. So until I see it, I just, I'm not believing it. And I think it's the onus is on him to prove everyone wrong. Yeah. And it sounds like the, uh, like you mentioned, the front office still likes him, but how close is he to Wally Pip territory? Like he's just not on the field, you know, like if Zach Bond is playing good, I know Zach Bond's not really this big guy. They signed him for what a million and a half or whatever it was. But if Nicobe's not out there showing anything and Devin keeps making plays and Zach Vaughn keeps making plays, how's he going to get on the field? Yeah, I mean, um, Vic Fangio mentioned Zach Vaughn too, as we know. Yeah, <laughs> He's asked about the Vic inside Vic linebackers. Zach Vaughn, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, there's opportunity because, yeah, if Vaughn doesn't look good or someone gets hurt, you know, Nicobe's right there, I'm sure. And again, he was rotating in the first team at times. So, um, there might be certain sub packages where he's the guy. I'm not saying, you know, he can't um, find his way on the field at some point, but yeah, for now, I'm just, I'm, I'm not giving him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, you're going to get now with Nicobe. I think 
you're you're fine, but I'm sure you've already got some crap for one of your <laughs> other losers. A couple um, of them, yeah. Uh, Saquon Barkley, yeah, is in the losing. Now I'm with you. I mean, it, spring is not the time for running backs, um, yeah. certainly. And I think where Saquon's going to going to be impactful is in the running game mm-hmm. when the offensive line is out there and the play action is going to help. To, I think that's where he's going to be impactful. But we saw his, um, you know, it's a passing camp, and we saw at least some of the things they were trying to accomplish with him as a receiver, and they weren't great. As you mentioned, Zach Bond running stride for stride with him. Devin White, who's a great athlete, um, had him in his hip pocket on a wheel route. Mm -hmm. Um, But Bond, I mean, he's not Devin White from an athleticism standpoint. What the hell is he doing running with Saquon Barkley down the field? Um, And and I think you – I want to read what you wrote Mm. because I I like it. My overarching concern with the Barkley signing is not that he's going to be bad and useless. I think he'll be fine, but the Eagles are paying him to be morally fine, Mm -hmm. more than, you know, not merely fine. Yeah. And then they used the word special and weapon, and you brought yeah. that up. They set that bar. Right. I think he's a good player. I've said this consistently. Nobody hears it. He's a good player. But they're they're propping him up as a star. Mm-hmm. I think people are going to be disappointed. I really do, BLG. Yeah, I think his reputation precedes him. He obviously was an awesome player, but I don't think he's been like that same level of the guy since his first couple years in the league, you know, we're talking about since then he's had injury issues. He's had a ton of touches and he ranks like top five, top four in touches among active NFL players on a touches. So by the way, you, you put that football insights tweet out. That's ugly. That is. Yeah. Look at this company in there and you can say like, okay, the giants didn't have a good offensive line. Okay. But still, there's like a missed tackle rate in there. You would still maybe like to see, you know, some more forced missed tackles, um, yeah. which is still possible. Maybe he's not, you know, gaining a ton of yardage after that because the offensive line isn't helping him out the most. But like, I just, and again, yeah. Uh, and look, again, for any kind of these winners, losers, there's this disclaimer in the article too that, you know, let's just acknowledge this for what it is. Let's Frank, not make it yeah. the end of the world. Frank but yeah. like, look at Will Shipley. Uh, Will Shipley had a really nice day in minicamp on Wednesday, a week yeah, from, ago from today, catching the ball. So we saw like a running back be able to kind of show some juice. Even Kendall Milton had a couple catches yeah, that were like he looked looked fast good. after that. So, you know, I'm not saying those guys are better than Saquon, obviously, but my point is like, if we saw some of these other players kind of pop a little bit, like, why wasn't there a single moment of that from Saquon in these drills? And maybe, you know, he's going half speed. He's trying to take it easy, not get hurt. Okay. You know, we'll see if anything changes in training camp. But I just would have liked to see, like, one kind of moment you could kind of hang your hat on and be like, wow, that's why they signed Saquon. He looks different out there. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. He didn't have a great spring. Um, and all the context, and I try to add it, it's not. But as you mentioned, and, I, you know, Will Shepley, it, Will had a really difficult day, the first OTAs. I don't know if you remember, but. Mm-hmm. He dropped one. He was fighting another one, bobbled, brought it in, and he progressively got better. But your point is a good one. If he showed something, he was really good Mm -hmm. on that um, uh, one day. And Kendall Milton showed something (laughs) now against the third team and all that kind of stuff. They showed a little bit of juice. That means you can, hey, let's see a splash. Um, And we didn't see a splash. So I think that was very fair. I just don't think. Um, people are going to take it very well. You probably already got some crap about it, but that football insights tweet I was talking yeah. about uh, the, the chart of, of force missed tackles and scrimmage yards per touch. He's in the, he's in the bottom of the NFL over a long sample size. Yeah. I think it was is, 21, 2021 20, to 20. Yeah. The last three seasons. Yeah. And he's there with like uh, Latavius Murray, Chub- Chuba yeah. Hubbard, you know, like AJ Dillon, like those are some of the guys he's around in that category. Yeah, it ain't good. It ain't good. And everything's blamed on 
the Giants offensive line. But as somebody earlier in my career who got to cover Adrian Peterson, if you're that good, you make something happen. Right. If you're special. Right. And but that's I what just, and like you said, that's what they're selling him as. Yes. Um, so a little bit of a concern there. Now, since people will accuse me of, of being uh, too negative, we'll go to the positive because you had more positives than negatives. True. Uh, from spring practices and basically the entire cornerback room. Those guys were great. <laughs> yeah, um, I read BLG's article, my cornerback, 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 cornerback. <laughs> Yeah, and they were. They were all yeah, great. No, yeah, they were. Um, even Tyler Hall, who I agree with, I had mm-hmm. him in my tier two stars because mm-hmm. you know I wanted to take a look at maybe some unheralded players who aren't um, thought of as much. And I thought Tyler did a really good job. But the two rookies, Quinn Young, Cooper, uh, DeGene, Kaylee Ringo, I think is going to be a, a, a starting cornerback in this league. Mm-hmm. I think the best player in the spring overall was Isaiah Rogers. Mm-hmm. Um, Reed Blankenship, I'm with you. Reed's a guy I want to focus on BLG because I I see a lot of Eagles fans that think that the Eagles got to get better at safety. They got to bring in Justin Simmons or something like that. I think the Eagles really, really, really like Reed Blankenship. I don't think they're looking for an upgrade at safety. Do you? I don't think they would maybe be opposed to adding a safety at some point just for more, you know, depth because they only have really like three true full-time players there, not, you know, including Avante Maddox who can obviously move over there. We saw some of that, but yeah, I mean, their actions show that they like Reed Blankenship because they didn't have to sign him to the extension that they did. They could have let him, you know, um, if they really wanted to and were kind of more skeptical, uh, hit restricted free agency or go through that process. And instead they kind of just bought out that year and gave him the extension and, and they should like him because he makes plays. He looks really good in practice. He knows where to be. That has been a calling card for him. I think really even dating back to his rookie season, he has it above the shoulders at the safe safety position. And he has a knack for making plays on the ball. And I think he kind of gets criticized for some struggles down the stretch last year. And, I'm not going to say that he was great, and he did have those struggles. Same time, the entire defense kind of fell off a cliff, as we know. And I also think that, you know, he really took the brunt of some of these injuries that he had earlier in the season and yet was still able to play through most of them. And, in fact, I think I think I saw something this offseason that reminded me of there was like a uh, – I think it was the Bills game, uh, the overtime game, where Reed Blankenship played like a – and like a record and maybe an NFL record or almost close to it of snaps in a single game. And even the entire season, he played like a ton oh, of yeah. snaps. They had that stretch where they were on the field for like three, four consecutive games and unbelievable amount of defensive snaps. Yeah. And, and by the way, he missed the playoff game. I think a lot of people, mm. um, Obviously, AJ wasn't there, and that was the focus, and they really struggled without him. But they really struggled without Reed Blankenship, yeah, um, defensively. Um, and he was, out, and that's a concern because he had three different injuries, but he only missed one game each time. Mm-hmm. Um, you'd like to see him stay on the field, so agree. But but he plays such a physical style of football. Um, maybe maybe you're going to see a, a couple games missed each year, but I think he's a good player. And I think people just default to, oh, he was undrafted. We just went through this with TJ Edwards. At some point, you got to say, all right, that guy can play. I'm at that point with Reed Blankenship. Yeah, and TJ Edwards is now yes. a guy we all wish. I, I, I think at least if you're a fan of the Eagles, we all wish was still was still here for the linebackers' sake. BLG, I want to ask you about something that, to be honest, hasn't been talked about much at this point of the year because it's passing camp and you don't see a lot of line play. You don't see a lot of defensive linemen. Where are you with Josh Sweat going into this year? Is he a stock up, stock down for you right now? What's your expectation of him going into the year? The reason I ask is because the you know the Hassan Reddick news is out mm-hmm. there and he's not showing up. So how we can wave his pom poms a little bit about moving on from him? But what's that mean for Josh Sweat going into the twenty twenty four year? I mean, I I don't love the jersey number change for <laughs> yeah, starters. Right. Uh, right. Ninety four to ni- nineteen is a really bizarre was great 94 was a great number yeah that's a great number um especially for a big 
kind of yeah. lanky, yeah, imposing physically, imposing defensive end. Maybe like he's just want to be listed as a linebacker. Yeah, um, basically. Uh, yeah, but I don't, uh, I don't, I don't understand that. Hopefully, we'll talk to Josh. We'll get to ask yeah. him that question. That was a yeah. strange. Yeah, that was maybe it's something in his youth. I don't know. Um, yeah. I guess getting closer to the nine, you know, you used to wear the nine at yeah. Oh, maybe that's Florida it. State, yeah. But yeah. like, and obviously you can't wear it here. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I guess, but like, he already had nine in the ninety four. So that's I don't. True. Yeah. I don't. I don't really get it. But to answer the question, you know, outside of the jersey number, I mean, it's it's like a huge year for him because he yeah. he finishes last year ice cold. Um, one sack in the, I think it was the playoff game, but like basically since the bye week, you know, the regular season yeah. didn't have a sack. Um, and now was, was potentially, you know, considered to be, uh, a, a, ca- a cap casualty. You know, there was some thought the Eagles just might cut him at least some based on the reporting that was out there. Yeah. Uh, and now he will be a free agent after this season. So there's like all the pressure in the world for him to step up and prove that, you know, he can handle probably more snaps. I'm guessing Vic Fangio might, you know, play him a little bit more or at least similar to what the Eagles ha- were at last year. Um, so there's a ton of pressure on him. Yeah. Speaking the, of, uh, yeah. Speaking quick, of the re- follow up though, the thing that concerns me is last year he fell off a cliff because it seemed like he was getting too many snaps. Mm-hmm. I don't know how his snap number is going to go down. Me and John talked about it a little bit. No, yeah. no, you no relying snaps, on Brandon baby. Graham to take more snaps. I mean, to get rid of, you know, to, to, to make Josh Sweat's number go down. I don't see it. You got rid of Reddick. Mm-hmm. I think Josh Sweat's going to play even more this year, potentially. That scares me. Yeah. Well, that's another, another problem I had with the Reddick move is just that like the rotation was already not deep enough last yeah. year based on how they're using it. On Nolan Smith too. That's another yeah. Guy. yeah. And now it's thinner, but Hey, I mean, I think you, that's what you're just going to have to do. You're going to have to sink or swim with some of your depth there and see if they can actually handle it or not. Yep. It, it's counterintuitive, but Xander brought that up. So I'll bring it up to you. I, I don't know if I said it, but I'm starting to think, you know, Brandon's done after this year. He doesn't need to be on a pitch count anymore. Mm-hmm. So why True. can't he play that's a, a good point. bit more? Yeah. That's a that's a good point. Yeah, maybe he wants to play a little bit more too. Yeah. You know, it's knowing, like you said, knowing that this is it for him and he can kind of empty the tank here. So yeah, I think that's actually a really good point. Yeah. I think it's a great um, point. I just struggle with the idea that Josh and I, I agree, John. I actually do. I think Brandon Graham's gonna want to play more, but like logically, I'm like 35 year old take snaps away from Josh. I don't I don't really see that, especially mm-hmm. in the NFL, but hey, maybe I guess it's a possibility. Well, if you're a Super Bowl contender, again, it's a little bit different. And Brandon's still pretty productive with mm-hmm. a limited amount of snaps. Obviously he's got to be yeah. productive if he falls off a cliff because of his age, that's an issue. But I mean, I think he'd be willing mm-hmm. and there's no need for a pitch count at this point for this being it for him. So I think it's one of those outside the box way of thinking mm-hmm. a- about it that may happen, but most of it comes to Nolan Smith. Nolan Smith has to step up and play significant snaps. No question about that. And I don't know if that's a good position to be in, but he looks a little bit bigger, uh, BLG. He's been in the weight room. They fixed the shoulder, even though he doesn't like to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Um, He was the 30th overall pick. A lot of people thought he might be the 13th overall pick. Mm -hmm. So he's got talent. Why do people close the door on Nolan Smith? I think, you know, people take the signal from him not playing a lot last year and the coaching staff not trusting him. And I think that's fair when a coaching staff doesn't play a player. It can indicate that they're not ready or good enough. But I also think there are times where the coaching staff gets it wrong. And I think they got it wrong with Nolan Smith to the point of where, you know, he wasn't playing enough. They could have rotated him more in last year. And I think when they did use him, they were trying to get a little too cute with it, a little too creative and having him drop in different things where I would like to see him kind of just get more of the traditional, be able to go after the passer. And, you know, it, it, the kind of, you know, when you think about Nolan Smith and him being relatively undersized, you would think he might not be the best run defender. Not the case. He's actually, I think, really yeah, good. He was at actually s- very good in Georgia, setting the yeah. edge. So I don't worry about that. And therefore, that, like, that's a kind of a nice like baseline to have. At the very least, he's gonna he's not going to be a liability in run defense he's gonna set the edge okay now give him those reps to actually see if he can get better and improve as a pass rusher yeah i think the pressure is on with nolan smith this year i mean if you just if we can in our minds real quick go ahead to a year from now if if quinion mitchell plays 40 snaps or whatever nolan smith played last year Mm. 
we're not going to be happy. I, you know, I feel like Nolan kind of blending in right now. Cause remember he had Jalen Carter taken in that first round too. So everybody was focused on Jalen Carter. Nolan Smith is still a first round pick. It's mm -hmm. time to put up or shut up. I would say for Nolan Smith, even here in year two. So definitely a big, uh, and maybe Jalen Hunt, uh, Jalen Hunt is a prodigy. We all think he's a, uh, you know, uh, developmental project and it probably is, but who knows? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just the natural, uh, and maybe he factors into it as well. So a uh, lot of projection though, and Bryce Huff better be a player, um, yeah. as well. Number one, uh, but the Reddick stuff coming out with the jets. I mean, if how he wanted to spike the football, he could spike the football. Anybody <laughs> who thought Hassan Reddick was coming back to, play on the final year of his contract they were nuts um and that's sort of playing out with the jets as well where would you have gone with hassan reddick he, uh, his reports he wanted 25 million he's gonna be 30 did you still want him back now that it's clear that what he wanted and what needed to happen if he was going to come back I, yeah, I would have made a better effort to make it work than the Eagles did, which to me kind of was just like a non-starter for them and drawing a line in the sand for an aging kind of player. But I just think that that like sometimes you make an exception, and I think the exception to make is for him. And I don't think, you know, the Jets' mishandling of Reddick, I think, since the trade doesn't mean like the Eagles were totally justified in making the trade. It kind of just speaks to more – to me, how dysfunctional and dumb. Oh, yeah, the Jets, the Jets are dysfunctional. Yeah, why yeah. do you make that trade without the deal in place already? Right. That's how I would do yeah. it. Yeah, right. But that's. I just mean, mean you know, he wanted. He obviously wants a, a new rework contract. Sure. He wasn't coming back. There were some people who would argue with me that said he'd come back, and I said after Bryce Hop at fifteen million a year. Yeah. No. 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 Never gonna happen. See, here's yeah. but does twenty million a year get the deal done with his sign? No, it's not what he wanted. I know he was he's he's asking for twenty five, but that's where I wonder. And BLG, I'll ask you. I asked Johnny Mac. Do you think this is more contract for the Eagles with him, or is it just the player? I mean, uh, maybe they didn't want the headache of the player. By the way, Vic Fangio is also a defensive coordinator who strikes me. He's gonna put you in different situations. And you're gonna want to be able. You're gonna want to do it for him. Hassan was more of a one-trick pony. He, you heard him. He didn't like dropping in coverage. Vic Fangio strikes me as a guy that wants players to want to do what he asks them and be happy doing it, and 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 respect the coach to go and do it. Maybe they just didn't want the player. I don't. If they did, I just I wouldn't think that's a good reason to me. Just because again, you can. It, I, I I just boil it down to. Fourth most sacks in the NFL since 2020. Yeah. Like it's, it's like an amazing yeah. thing. That's a lot and, of production, yeah. And again, um, I point this out often that last year he was on pace for a better year than he had even in 2022, even with coming into the season, you know, with a slow start because of the cast on his hand. Right. But didn't get there because, yeah, they changed the defensive coordinator and were nonsensically having Hassan Reddick like drop way too much. So um, they kind of sabotaged him in that way. But like I've seen no signs of a Hassan Reddick slowing down. And I think I'm comfortable projecting that he's still going to be productive beyond his 30s because, number one, he didn't play a lot earlier in his career. So I think he has a lot of gas left in the tank. And number two, um, pass rushers can age gracefully like we're just talking about brandon graham you know that's yeah. a player who can still contribute yeah. and bg yeah. just had like a career season a few years two yeah. years ago um so i just i don't buy the concerns there at brandon gout and make sure you follow uh blg on x uh read him at bleeding green nation his winners and losers send all heat mail to him not to me <laughs> i get plenty of that um uh good talking to you blg and um uh, we'll see you next week. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Thanks, BLG. See you, brother. There's BLG joining us on Birds 365. Johnny Mac, what would you go? What would you have paid Hassan Reddick? What would be a uh, 20? Reddick? I would have went to 21 million. That's that's right brother. about where mine would be 20 to 21, maybe 22 if I really wanted to. I, I will say the dropping stuff, and Vic tends to drop more than others and he's going to drop more he's going to drop the edge rushers a little bit more than jg did and sean Desai did um 
But that's overrated. It's not like he does it a, a million times. And I yeah. think a lot of – Nick Sirianni even that's came over and stopped practice because he saw people writing about it. It was like, it's a passing game, but we're practicing that. Um, there's no rush. There's no – so guys are out there – um, practicing their coverage technique, and you saw Nolan Smith dropping a lot and other players dropping a lot, even Brandon Graham, Josh Sweat, guys like that. But it, I'm like, even last year, the most Hassan Reddick dropped, and it was a late game, and I forget, I'll, I'll double check, but it was late in the season, he dropped seven times. That was the high. That's it. Yeah, people, how many defensive people staff? overrate that. Oh, to a ludicrous degree, a ludicrous degree. It's not that big of a deal. It's just a curveball in a game. And that particular game, the seven times is a little bit too much. But even that, who cares? Yeah, and I wouldn't rule out that you're going to see that this year, though, with Vic Fangio. That's why I asked the question. It's not so much about that I don't like the player. I just wonder if Vic is like, I don't, I don't want a guy that's going to give me a hard time if I need to drop him in coverage. You know, if that's what my defense calls for in that particular game, I'm going to do it. I need a guy that's willing to do it. And that's where I wonder that plus the money plus the, you know, the, the I don't know, maybe you've heard some talk that he was a little bit of a headache in the locker room. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not in the locker room, but you have heard that you've read that some places. I wonder if the whole thing added up for the Eagles would be like, just move this guy, you know, even if it's for a future condition. I think it's got more to do with age and I think. Um, and money. Yeah, age, money, shelf life. Um, and, and, you know, the, the adage is better to give up on a player a year early than a year late. I think that's where um, it comes into it. Um but, you know, everybody points to Van Ginkle because Van Ginkle had such a great year um, with Mick in Miami. And I, I'm still surprised that the Eagles didn't try to sign him, to be honest, because he's a really good player. I think PFF had him, I'm, I'm trying to look it up real quick, uh, out of all edge defenders in the NFL, um, they had him number seven only only players ahead of them were miles garrett micah parsons nick bosa max crosby tj watt and khalil mack that's good, how good, good that's how good he was in miami last year and if you break it down even further he was he was seventh as an actual pass rusher he was first as a coverage player in those splat and hook defenders. So that to me is the perfect guy for Vic Fangio's defense. And a lot of people brought up and how we tried to compare Zach Bond to him who hasn't done it. Maybe he projects it in that role. Um, and he got hurt last season and he's still not cleared. And I don't even know what he was dealing with some kind of foot injury. So maybe that factored into it as well, but I'm very surprised the Eagles didn't go after him in free agency. Very yeah, I, I thought so for sure, especially with the, some of the ties you heard uh, to him and Vic. John, I got to ask you, though, people in the chat bring it up. I was thinking of it when you said it. Better to move a year early than a year late. There is Slay. Get the young guys out there. Yeah, well, you know, I, 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 I'm not saying that's not even a potential happening uh, because – you know, PLG mentioned or Mike mentioned, one of them mentioned Bradbury. I mean, Bradbury went from an all pro to falling off a cliff. So it always happens. You know, the only undefeated NFL person is Father Time. It's getting yeah. everybody. It yeah. took a while to get Tom Brady, but he got he even got Tom Brady. Yeah. Um, it happens to everybody. Could it happen to Slay? Yes. Is it realistic um, for them to move on? No, that's my only point. Yep. All right. So fair enough. I I'll agree to disagree with you. I I, I agree that it's not the not the an easy decision. But I do I do wonder whether how he's going to move on from one. And of by the way, the Eagles were this close to moving on from Slay. That's what I mean. Last year, it's not like this was like oh we want him to retire here. We love the guy. Like last year, he was basically off the roster for a week. Well, the Eagles were, if you remember, they were trying to get CJ back. They wanted to get two of the three back. 
and it was CJ, it was Darius, it was James. Right. Um, and the original plan was to get CJ and Slay back. And CJ was balking, thought they lowballed him. Uh, and then it became um uh um it, it became CJ and Brad. It, no, it became Slay and Bradbury, and then it right. became CJ and Bradbury because they worked out a deal. They they thought Bradbury would get too much money and way more than he got, and he was willing to come back, and it didn't work out. But once they made the deal with with Bradbury, they were still focused on CJ, and that's when it became CJ going to Baltimore, um, and. Uh, excuse me, Slay going to Baltimore. Yes, yeah, Slay going getting to all, Yeah, no. I no. apologize for getting all lumped up. So they were still working to get CJ back. And then it finally became clear it wasn't going to work. And then they went back to Slay. And evidently, Big Dom was the one who gave him the call, um, which is funny in another way. But anyway, um, that's kind of what happened. It wasn't that they thought Slay was descending or declining. It's about they felt they only had the the space and the room to get two of them back, and the original plan was to get Slay and CJ, but none of it worked out, and then other dominoes started to fall. Yep, makes sense. Uh, show real quick, show enough brings up a good point. If you move on from Slay and one of your young corners gets injured, what do you got? It's a good point. I mean, you do have four young guys that are, that are looking good with the two new draft picks, and then you have Ringo and you have. Isaiah Rogers, but uh, you're, you do make a good point where they have depth. You might as well not get rid of your depth. So I get it uh, from that perspective. Johnny Mac, good show today. I thought Mike Gill was good. He brought a little bit of <laughs> logic, I guess you could say, or an outsider's perspective from being in London. He comes in, he's like, ah, I'm not making much of this Jalen Hurts comment, which is good to hear. Um, and then we had BLG who brought some good insight as well. So pretty good show today. Uh, good job. Uh, yeah, we'll be back here tomorrow. Uh, good stuff, Johnny Mac. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We appreciate everybody in the chat. Make sure you guys like the show on your way out. I don't know how many likes we're up to, but I'd like to get to 100. Oh, we're only at 77, guys. So hit that like button on your way out. It helps the show grow, and we appreciate all of you. James James Jones, uh, the, our resident commander fan who got me to Is give he, him a uh, the former receiver for the Packers, James Jones? Yeah, he might be. He's our, he's our resident uh, commander fan. He actually, uh, I'm sure you remember, he got me to give him a commander for five bucks. So pretty good stuff. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Hit the like button on your way out. We'll catch you tomorrow on Birds 365.